thank you for hosting me here, Nijad. Um, I'm humbled and um, I'll be speaking English because we have our <laughs> American guests. Um, I was asked how come you make wine in Lebanon nowadays and how did you start and how did it happen? Um, nothing really happened um, on, a, on a spreadsheet or as a business plan. It's just that we grew up in this wonderful land you were describing earlier. And um, it, was, it was stolen from us. Um, in 75 we had to flee. We are from the southern suburbs of Beirut, from Shia. And then uh, to the Bekaa Valley where we had a country house with horses and dogs and played in the fields. And we had to flee from there. Our German shepherd kind of chased the car of my mom at the time. The last weekend we were there and we, my brother and I were stuck on the back windshield of her white Volvo crying that Tigra come with us. She said we'll come the next weekend. And it wasn't until 17 years later that I came back. So I'm sure lots of you here are, have roots in Lebanon or have had uh, many encounters of such, but I, we left Lebanon, we were fortunate to be sent to France for studies, and I came back from the US in, 19, in the early 90s and 92. <laughs> I was working, I studied architecture in France, I was working at UCLA Medical Plaza and uh, as an engineer, and I came the first day they started bombing uh, Saddam on the door of my office there was a sketch of a fighter jet bombing Saddam out of Iraq. So I realized that there is a bit <laughs> lack of understanding, you know, you take a flight from Beirut to Baghdad is as far as from Beirut to Paris, so I realized I might be better off doing something useful with my life in Lebanon. So I went back, uh, slept a few months on the rooftop of our own house with squatters in the, in the, in the house in the Beka, eventually they left. And I started making Arak by pure coincidence. I met an elderly gentleman that was displaced from Mount Lebanon. He got me into making Arak. The first bottles I sold at my parents' pharmacy in a corner as an organic uh, crafted spirit. And uh, then came the idea of the blue bottle, thinking of our Phoenician ancestry, the purple people as they were referred to by the Greeks. And this is how Messiah came to life to a gentleman that came to send me calls one day, we speak French in Lebanon. I get a call one day before WhatsApp and, and those mobile phones. <laughs> it was, uh, he said, don't laugh, my name is Jean-Marie Fressex. So fresh sex, I was 26, 27. I said, well, <laughs> what can I do for you, sir? He said, I provide what, uh, corks to the wine industry in Lebanon. I said, well, I'm into Arak, not wine. He said, word is on the street, you're going to be making wine. I said, well, introduce me to winemakers from France willing to invest with me in a winery in Lebanon. I buy course from you. This is how I met the Brunier family from Vieux Telegraph. I met Dominique Ebrard from Cheval Blanc. I had no clue what Cheval Blanc was at the time, and this is how I came into wine. So it's all destiny. Um, I'm I'm grateful you are giving me this opportunity, Nijat and Zaina, to talk a bit about not just Messiah, but Lebanon. We're going to show you a few pictures, especially for our guests that do not necessarily know Lebanon, before taking you into more uh, cuisine and wines. So, and I will say to you what I learned, because I did not know all that before getting into wine. Why the Phoenicians? Why, why Lebanon? Why the climate? Why, despite everything, we still have this quality of wine? It's not that you are geniuses, it's the nature of this uh, fascinating country that makes the whole difference. It's the altitude that you see here. Um, So those are two mountains here, Mount Lebanon and the second mountain range that separates us from Syria. And actually the Bekaa Valley is a high altitude plateau. So what compensates for the latitude of Lebanon is the altitude. Snow-capped mountains almost year round and 300 days of sunshine. And the breeze of the Mediterranean that tempers the climate. This is the essence of why the wines are so great. About 8,000 years ago, the first wild crossing of the Vitis vinifera occurred in the Levant due to, to, those, to the climate and the altitude. 
Oh, gosh. This is the family. In 1975, I found this picture uh, in our house that was looted. So my mom had the apron here. I mean, you know, it's been uh, one of the weekends with their uh, friends who were there. So, I'm sure many of you do not know that Lebanon is the only wine region mentioned in the Old Testament and in the Bible. This is how important Lebanon is in wine and wine history. Okay? Um, the Romans, those are our French partners, the Romans that took winemaking to an industrial scale at the time, built their temple of Bacchus. You know, the Romans made wine across their empire, all the way from Asia to Scotland. They built one temple for Bacchus, the god of grapes and wine in the Bekaa Valley. And look how, how high uh, the mountains are with snow. This is the temple of Jupiter, Bacchus, and there is a temple for Venice. That's the winery. Beyond this mountain is uh, Syria in the background. And the vines get a couple of months of snow, which is fantastic because we do not irrigate. And the vines dig in deep to find moisture and nutrients in the soil. And this is how the microfilaments get all these, you, we say in French, le goût du caillou, the taste of the stone, the minerality, the finesse. It's easy to make wine with a lot of fruit and opulence and a lot of oak and bodybuilt wines, but it's much more difficult to make wines that have uh, this minerality. And this is what we will try to portray. Had you had the rosé or the white now, you will see that. So since we have built a second winery up in Fara over in Mount Lebanon, where we, where we grow grapes in altitude, Lebanon is home to the highest altitude vineyards of the Northern Hemisphere, so you know. So lots of altitude, look, we're above the cloud line, you see? The clouds are here, you're above the clouds. So this is the altitude, this is the magnificence of, of making wine in Lebanon. Um, <coughs> those are the cellars in Fara. And then you see we're above the cloud again at the foothills of the ski slopes of Mount Lebanon. So four of my American friends or our American guests here that have not seen it, I think this will give you a, a bit of insight about Lebanon. So those are the wines. We're going to have a red next, with a, and we're going to have an Arak in between with the bit of Maisie. So <laughs> Zena and I communicated on how to present the evening for guests that are familiar or less familiar with the Maisie, mm -hmm. the Lebanese cuisine, and we were discussing earlier with Anthony about the, the restaurants and the Lebanese cuisine, how it, it put Lebanon on the platform. It's, it's amazing that you go now to any Whole Foods or you have hummus and baba ghanoush and tabbouleh and, and the wines are actually coming along this path and so is Ara. Ara is now very popular in the US and getting more and more sexy and popular and actually um, you see it in cocktails and so forth. But just to give you a hint on what is Ara, or at least authentic Ara, um, I didn't inherit anything when we when we recuperated the land. I, I went to France to understand distillation, and when Prime Minister Miati got nominated the first time, it happened. They came to our winery, and I took him around. I said uh, he, he looked at the, at the stills, and he said, uh, "Oh, what is this?" I said, "I'm sure you don't know where these come from." So I said, "No, they are copper made in Tripoli in Lebanon." not imported from France or Armagnac or what have you. For just for your you know little anecdote, it's the Arabs that have discovered distillation in the 17th century. <laughs> At their peak, you know, when, when they stopped drinking things doing good. But hey, now let's <laughs> I've had a couple of drinks, so we'll keep it focused. Um, Arak is a distilled, at least in Lebanon, it's distilled from, a, from a grapes. So we make wine, then we distill the wine, and second distillation, and during the third distillation we add any seeds. The only botanical we use at Masaya are any seeds, and our Arak in general. And uh, then we age it in amphora and clay jars, produced in Deir Shabir. And, um, and this, is, this is the the only spirit that is actually al alkaline. So Nijad, it's not acidic, no reflux after. It's, it's really, uh, originally it's medicine, no? Arak is originally medicine. And 
um, we bottled it in a blue, purple, blue bottle in reference to our Phoenician ancestors that brought the silk all the way from India to the old world and they mastered dyeing the silk purple by grinding the murex, it's a seashell on our shores. And they used to dye it and they would have purple hands and the ancient Greeks named them Phoenicians, Phoenico in ancient Greek is purple, and this is how we, we came out with the, we came about with the Arak uh, blue bottle. <laughs> Just to tell you how much history and how much I have learned along the path of you know recuperating the land and, and producing wine and Arak, and at the time also of ancient civilization, the wine was called the Grand Cru was called Bibline. It stemmed from Biblos in Lebanon. So the Phoenicians did not only trade silk and what have you, but they brought... Uh, that's why, as Lebanese, we integrate so well in the communities that we, we go to. We never conquered by force, we never had armies. We, it was always by exchange and by trade and by this is how you got the alphabet, the numbers and so forth. So we were discussing earlier, I think Lebanon is in a difficult path now. But uh, Lebanon will survive those circumstances. What are 40, 30, 50 years in, a, in an age of a nation that is uh, six, seven thousand years old? So Lebanon will always be around and armies come, so armies go, but Lebanon will, will, will prevail. The, the snow we get on our mountains every winter and 300 days of sunshine a year are the blessing. I would like to say a little word about the next one we're going to have. It's a 50% Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's a bit full-bodied. I chose it for the, for the dinner with the meat. Um, it's, it's a wine that has been... Uh, uh, that had got some acclaim by Parker and so forth. But I would like to tell you a little thing. The grapes, when you make natural wine, you know, when you taste a grape in Lebanon, it has a taste that is un unparalleled. It's acidic, it has uh, sugar. It's not, it's not like a grape when you have uh, served in a cocktail next to cheese where it's all sweet as if you're, you're having a, a piece of candy. It's, there is much more to it. And the fruit in Lebanon, thanks to the climatology, the altitude, the sun and the snow and the wind from the Mediterranean, chasing the bugs and provoking the vine leaves to share. So the fruit is exceptional and this is why the wines are, are wonderful. 98% of the quality of a good wine is in the fruit, in the vineyard. The rest, you know, how, no matter how fancy the winery is, big the vats or the, you know, uh, technology or design, this doesn't affect it. The reality is in the land and this is why the, our, our, our wines have, have uh, transcended the, the centuries uh, with quality.